<laughs> right. So welcome everyone to the January 17th, 2024 Open Space Board of Trustees meeting. We are glad that you're able to join us tonight. I'm gonna to run through the agenda real quickly just to make sure everyone knows uh, what's on it and the timeframes that we'll be generally shooting for. Uh, there are two items that the board will consider this evening for discussion and there will be uh, no public hearing on either of them. So if you would like to make uh, comments uh, to the board, um, you will need to do that during the public comment period, uh, which will follow momentarily. Uh, the first item that we will consider would be um, the strategic guidance um, informing the annual budget and work plan development for the Open Space and Mountain Parks Department. And following that, we are going to discuss a request from the City of Boulder's Utilities Department to permanently use and manage an approximately 2.2 acre portion of the Van Vliet open space property to construct, access, operate, and maintain elements of the South Boulder Creek flood mitigation project. So we will um, have uh, staff presentations for both of those items and then uh, board discussion will follow. So with that, um, uh, we'll start with approval of the December meeting minutes. With that, we will need to do the roll call. <laughs> I always forget that. Um, yeah, let's do a roll calls. Um, so if you could respond um, when I call your name, we appreciate it. Uh, Brady? Here. John? Present. Michelle? Here. Harmon? Here. And I as well. So we have a unanimous board. Thanks, John. Um, so now the minutes. Uh, okay. the, do you mind if Sam runs through the rules of decorum for favorite meeting? I don't. I think that's totally appropriate. Sam, would you do that? <laughs> okay, I think that's on now. There we go. So I'm share my screen for the presentation. Okay. The city has engaged with community members to co-create a vision for productive, meaningful, and inclusive civic conversations. This vision supports physical and emotional safety for community members, staff, and board and commission members, as well as democracy for people of all ages, identities, lived experiences, and political perspectives. For more information about this vision and the community engagement processes, please visit this link. The following are examples of rules of decorum found in the Boulder Revised Code and other guidelines that support this vision. These will be upheld during this meeting. All remarks and testimony shall be limited to matters related to city business. No participant shall make threats or use other forms of intimidation against any person. Obscenity, racial epithets, and other speech and behavior that disrupts or otherwise impedes the ability to conduct the meeting are prohibited. Participants are required to sign up to speak using the name they are commonly known by, and individuals must display their whole name before being allowed to speak online. Currently, only audio testimony is permitted online. Um, if we uh, have folks who would like to um, speak during the public comment section, uh, there are two ways to do that. Uh, first is to raise your hand. So you'll either see the raise hand icon at the bottom of your screen, or you can click the participants box the three dots on the bottom right, and then click raise hand and it'll raise your hand for you. If you're joining by phone, which we don't have anyone joining that way right now, but you'll press star nine and it'll raise your hand. So I will stop sharing my screen now, all set. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Sam. Uh, I am hopeful by the end of my tenure as chair that I'll actually get to be able to do this with, without assistance, but I do appreciate that. <laughs> So, so now if we can uh, turn to the minutes of the uh, December board meeting, if anyone has any uh, comments or edits on page one. Seeing none, uh, comments or edits on page two. 
Seeing none, I will entertain a motion to adopt the minutes. So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Uh, second. Great. Uh, this will be a roll call as well. Uh, Brady? Yes. Uh, John? Yes. Michelle? Yes. Armin? Yes. And I vote yes as well. So the minutes of the December Open Space Board of Trustees meeting are adopted unanimously. Our next item on the agenda is matters from the board. And uh, there is one uh, on the agenda that was part of the written information in our packet, the request from the public service company um, to, uh, let's see, approve utility agreements for the use of certain city of Boulder open space lands to install and maintain subsurface electric and telecommunication utilities via open trenching or boring pursuant to the disposal procedures of the Boulder City Charter. Um, yes. Right, right. <laughs> What's wrong with this agenda? <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got a you you've got a, a brief introduction of what's going to happen after public comments. <laughs> no mystery now. <laughs> yeah. So yes, uh, an important part of the open space meeting. Um, please, if there are public wishing to comment, uh, now is the time. And if you let Sam know of your desire, uh, we will listen to your comments. Thank you. Um, so it looks like we have participants uh, online. And so if you would like to speak, we don't have anyone signed up in advance. So if you'd like to speak, please raise your hand. You can either click the raise hand icon at the bottom of your screen or click participants, the three dots at the bottom right, and then um, click raise hand from there. And then I don't see anyone joining by phone. So we'll um, address that if it does come up. Okay, so I do see two hands. So the first uh, hand is Lynn Siegel, followed by Harlan Savage. So Lynn Siegel, we'll start with you. And Lynn, you should be able to unmute yourself now. So um, it appears that um, the quadrant where um, par the parcel of land baseline and see you, um, where the broker in and dark horse and Corelli's, et cetera, is, it's going to be all just blighted, just demoed. And, you know, the reason I'm talking about this in front of OSBT is a number of things. For one, CU does not own Boulder. We do not want to give them the open space to be able to complete CU South. They've got 900 some bedrooms they're renting out in the millennium and another thousand in this quadrant of space that Coburn is aiming towards. Now, this is my suggestion. There's a huge amount of the public that actively supported keeping the dark horse going. Now, the, the people that are I guess associated with Williams Village um, and the ownership of this whole land where Corelli's and all that is, is um, in a position where they, unless the city council votes to above their intentions, landmark the dark horse and these other spaces, they will be demolished in the honor of the golden housing opportunity. Now, housing does not help the Open Space Board of Trustees. It hurts because the more people you have here, the more people you have invading open space and we're already in a deficit for open space. Um, I really don't trust anything the OSBT does anymore after you fired Caroline Miller and that should not have been done. That was completely unethical. It's just like Lisa Sweeney Moran. There was not due process. Should have been a public hearing about that. And she should be on the board right now. Not that I don't like um, Harmon Zuckerman. In fact, I thought you were Bill Hollicky. He was had his back to me last night, but same difference. Um, in any case, 
Um, in the interest of open space, you should be advocating against housing developments like these, which only elevate the cost of housing, drive up the homelessness, and drive dollars away from open space and towards the endless homeless problem. And um, Caroline Miller did a really good job, and she needs to come back onto the board um, as soon as possible. And I'm sorry you can't violate my free speech to say that, but that's what I think, and that's what I know. Dan. Thank you, Lynn. Appreciate your comments. Okay, next we have Harlan Savage. Harlan, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Uh, did that work? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, first, uh, thank you for providing the staff memo that gives the background for tonight's meeting. Um, I have uh, two sets of questions um, that I think need clarification and amplification the first is uh, that the memo makes it clear that the lands in question are or will be owned by the city of Boulder and that they will be controlled, used, managed by the OSMP or utilities departments. And for clarity, I think more detail is needed in some of these statements. Um, importantly, the statement on pages 16 and 31 request the permanent transfer control use of land to utilities and permanent I think should be deleted for two reasons one these two instances are the only use of permanent I saw and the transfer of other lands to other departments do not indicate any degree of permanence and then second the document also makes it clear that if the dam is decommissioned abandoned that the land will revert to OSMP management. So it is not intended that utilities will permanently hold the land. And then the second thing is that there's significant detail in the memo, memo about groundwater conveyance system, the use of monitoring wells, etc. But the groundwater flow is sustaining an ecosystem designated by the natural area program, a state program. Shouldn't there also be a robust monitoring program to assess the retention of the high quality vegetation, both upstream and downstream of the groundwater conveyance system. In addition to monitor monitoring for the federally listed species there, I'm wondering if there are plans to monitor and assess the retention of the diverse plant, native plant and wildlife species that are there and to see if they are surviving, thriving, um, what's happened, um, to them as a result of building the dam and flood wall. So hopefully more attention uh, and more detail can be provided to answer these questions. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Harlan, uh, appreciate your comments. And yeah, I do think uh, we will address those uh, during the discussion uh, later in the meeting. Okay, so, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Sam, or, or anyone else? Okay, uh, I'm not seeing any other hands. If anyone else would like to speak, please raise your hand. Seeing no more hands. Great. Well, now we're poised at the moment on the agenda that I've been trying to get to the whole evening. <laughs> that is matters from the board. Um, and so there is... Uh, one matter on, on the agenda and the uh, written information. And Dan, I'm gonna ask you real quickly, just to summarize um, the, um, the information uh, again for the board's consideration. Uh, the board has heard information on this project previously. And uh, I think the change is basically as far as the construction of, um, of the, um, line or whatever if we originally heard that it was we were going to uh, do it through boring and now there, there's uh, the possibility of open trenching as well so um, if you could run by real quickly kind of uh, what your sense of the uh, changes are that we're asked to consider that'd be great sure yeah this is a uh, probably the fourth time now you'll see see this relatively 
similar project, but in a different iteration. So uh, about a year ago, this board and council approved uh, a, a, a right away for broad uh, for broadband util, uh, for IT and broadband to uh, connect to uh, certain aspects on the open space system. Uh, then uh, at the same time, there is a desire to underground the utilities from Excel to go from overhead to underground. And so uh, from a staff perspective, we really urged all the utility uh, interests to uh, co-locate so we don't have multiple trenching, multiple different areas where uh, utility underground infrastructure was, was being constructed. So what this means is that a one trench system in which all utilities will share and co-locate is now envisioned. So what that means is broadband uh, uh, as well as Excel and other utilities would all be co-locating in one, uh, one single source. Uh, so what will happen next month is you'll ha we'll have to basically undo <laughs> the approvals that you have previously granted by uh, uh, providing a, a redo of uh, considering a request for undergrounding of utilities to, uh, for the Chautauqua area, as well as to go up to the uh, uh, Mesa Reservoir on open space that uh, uh, both uh, Excel and uh, broadband need to get access to. So the idea is co-locating in one area, and now we've actually identified an area with overall uh, less length in order to get to that uh, uh, to those sites that are needed. So yeah, it's, it's back in front of you again, a little bit of a different iteration, and... Uh, so uh, this memo is just to daylight that fact, and we'll be back next month with a very short presentation, since I think you all know about the gist of this, and then asking for your consideration uh, and, and recommendation. Great. Thank you. That was uh, helpful. Uh, are there any uh, comments or questions from the board on this? Uh, thank you for the clarification. I had a weird sense of deja vu reading this. I went back through the minutes and I, I did, in fact, like make a motion to improve this last summer. So it it made me feel less crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad we accomplished that. Uh, Brady, did you uh, have anything you wanted to? Okay. Michelle? Yeah, Dan, I have a question on process. Is this something that we could pilot our, our consent agenda on? You said that we can, um, we're going to have a brief presentation next month, but is it something that we have to have a presentation on? Well, uh, it is, it, it is, in fact, we're, we are going through uh, the disposal related process. So we will need to have a public, technically have a public hearing on it, but we do promise to be very brief in our presentation, uh, but we will have to go through the steps of uh, uh, accepting public comment and then board deliberation. So uh, we will honor our part in making sure it's a very brief presentation and you all can then do your part. Okay. We'll look forward to that. Uh, are there any other comments or questions? Great. Um, are there other items uh, from the board that you would like to bring up? Seeing none, um, we will move on to matters from the department. And Dan, I will turn it over to you. Right, and Sam McQueen is going to make her way over to yeah. this side. <laughs> yeah, our first item is actually a follow-up uh, and, a, and a sort of a pilot, if you will, following up from our OSBT retreat in late September. As you all would call, we had a, uh, a discussion on, I think the spirit of the conversation is how could the board have more meaningful discussions and more meaningful participation in the annual budget uh, process that the organization, that the department goes through. And so we had a, a really great one hour, one hour plus conversation on it. And I think where we landed was, well, instead of those kind of almost perfunctory sequence of meetings uh, in the spring and early summer, in which we're looking at a whole bunch of P&L statements and, and really uh, I think the trustees felt like they didn't quite know where to plug in in that process we came up with this concept of why, why don't we have a late quarter four in this case, because that decision was just made we're uh, in early Q1 uh, ahead of uh, 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 the final assemblage of annual work plans and annual budget drafts to have a conversation on sort of that strategic guidance area, that one element that 
perhaps we weren't getting at in the springtime when you were already looking at uh, projects that are, you know, that were well are well vetted at the department level that are sequenced out. And so tonight is all about sort of testing that, piloting that concept of holding one of our budget meetings and probably will start to be more late quarter four, uh, more high level strategic guidance and getting the board's input at that level and, and see how it goes. And hopefully uh, some of the discussions that result today and over the years can help to guide uh, the staff to uh, look deeper into certain areas, uh, program areas, uh, uh, any elements of the strategic guidance that the uh, trustees are interested in knowing more about, perhaps uh, uh, asking us would it be possible to accelerate certain, certain of these areas. And then we can come back into the spring and say, here's what we heard from you and here's what we're sort of planning on and here's how it might show up in budgets and work plans and that sort of thing. So uh, again, uh, sort of a follow-up from the retreat and we reserve some time tonight to uh, uh, to kind of go through that. And I'm going to be partnered here with Sam McQueen, uh, who does a lot of our uh, coordination and lead and budget and work plan development. And we'll try to walk us through a presentation here that will be fairly brief and then turn it over to you all to have some discussion and see where we go. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Uh, good evening, trustees. Um, I'm Sam McQueen. I'm the Business Services Senior Manager, and I'll be presenting on strategic budget guidance with Dan tonight. So we'll start by giving an overview of strategic budget guidance. Next, we'll take a closer look at one type of strategic budget guidance called strategic enhancements. Then we'll review proposed changes to the budget process timeline, and we'll close with questions and discussion. So I'm going to turn it back to Dan from here to give us the overview of strategic budget guidance. Yeah, so there's a number of different uh, documents, plans, uh, uh, guidance that uh, we rely on, on, sort of that higher level up. Uh, and uh, we just listed here that uh, sort of come top to mind for us. And you start with some things that are sort of the highest level of strategic guidance, and that's the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan and what the uh, uh, city of Boulder is calling the SARE framework or sustainability, sustainability, equity and resilience framework. And then stemming down from those documents, you start to get a little bit more granular, although still very high up. Uh, the citywide strategic plan is going to be a new document that is going to be daylighted later in Q1 uh, with council. And that is an overall uh, a very high, uh, what are high priority strategies at the citywide level that we're, that we're looking to emphasize. And that will be a, a plan that council and, uh, and uh, uh, will interact with uh, later on at the retreat and possibly uh, at some other points in times later in quarter one. So that's a new uh, tool that is up and coming and, uh, and that is sort of looking at a three year sort of time horizon, if you will. And then below that, you start to get into the department levels in which we have our own master plan and then we have approved plans. Uh, and then we have what we call our strategic enhancements. And I think we introduced that topic to you or that document to you at the retreat. And those are just a couple of things that we highlight uh, from department leadership down to staff about, hey, we have, we have a lot of things going on, a lot of guidance, but here's a couple of areas that we really wanna make sure we move the needle on. So we call those strategic enhancements. Next slide, yeah. So here's kind of a look at the citywide guidance. Uh, of as far as where these, how these fit in, in terms of that pyramid of going at the very highest level and starting to get a little bit granular. So you start with the SARE framework on top, then you got the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan, then you move down to that new strategic, uh, citywide strategic plan, and then you start getting into individual department guidance. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Sam, who's gonna walk us through, um, more of that guidance at the department level. Thanks, Dan. Okay, so we'll shift to department right, department wide strategic budget guidance now, as Dan mentioned. So you may recognize this image from the master plan document. The master plan provides that first level of guidance, particularly the tier one strategies identified in the plan. That's followed by system wide management plans, then trail study area plans, and finally integrated site plans or ISPs. We'll talk about strategic enhancements later, but want to call out here that strategic enhancements could highlight components of any of these guidance documents in a given period. They provide extra emphasis on priorities from these other areas. 
So within the master plan, I mentioned that it identifies what we call tier one strategies. These are likely familiar to you as they're referenced in budget and other conversations with the OSBT. Um, tier one strategies are considered the most important and will be accelerated and emphasized with more staff time and funding. So those strategies are listed here. We'll look at a quick example of how tier one master plan strategies are referenced in our budget conversations. During the 2024 budget planning process with the OSBT, which took place in spring and summer 2023, we showed you five-year capital improvement program or CIP investments in each tier of master plan strategies. Overall, the investment by tier in the CIP is consistent with the department's goal to prioritize tier one strategies. We plan to continue tying our budget to master plan strategies and highlight investments by tier in the upcoming 2025 budget planning process. We're gonna shift our focus now to strategic enhancements. That's that bottom box down there. So OSMP strategic enhancements are one of several citywide or department-wide strategic budget guidance tools that we referenced earlier in the presentation. They're listed separately from the pyramid we just reviewed because as I mentioned, they're used to call out priorities from other guidance for particular emphasis in a given period. They're also used to communicate goals to OSMP staff and help set priorities for major projects or initiatives. And the strategic enhancements are typically shared with staff as part of the budget planning process for the next year. We've shared strategic enhancements with the OSBT in previous years, and some of those are listed here. They include make additional investments in equity programming, increase and in operationalize funding for agricultural management, and accelerate efforts in science and climate resilience. In practice, these have been used to inform OSBT agenda topics and budget priorities. So here are a few instances where strategic enhancements were referenced to determine agenda items for the OSBT. In January 2023, staff provided a prairie dog management update, which was informed by the particular emphasis on increasing and operationalizing funding for agricultural management that year. And uh, equity initiatives for board and commissions were discussed with the OSBT in February 2023, which aligns with the department's strategic enhancement to uh, to make additional investments in equity programming. And then a science and climate resilience update was reviewed in March, and then a tribal relations update was brought that same month, which again tied to OSMP's emphasis on making additional investments in equity programming. Here's an example of the use of strategic enhancements to guide budget decisions. Sorry, that is very small. It is also included in your memo, so hopefully um, I just tried to call out a few things here. Um, the increase in operationalized funding for agricultural management strategic enhancement was used to inform changes to personnel, non-personnel, and CIP budget items. You can see that over a two-year period, OSMP added agricultural land management, prairie dog, and water resources positions. On the non-personnel side, $200,000 was converted from pilot funding to an ongoing part of the department's budget to pay for barrier fencing. The barrier fencing example highlights that although something may be called a strategic enhancement for a year or two, OSMP doesn't stop working on these items after that period ends. The two-year period signifies increased focus and investment to accelerate the work, but that work is often maintained and becomes an ongoing part of the budget and work plan. The 2024 to 2025 strategic enhancements are listed here. They are wildland fire resilience programming and planning enhanced presence on the land and looking ahead, prioritize integrated work planning. Each of these is described in more detail in the memo. When we bring you 2025 budget planning materials, we'll call out where you're seeing these strategic enhancements. Finally, we want to walk you through a proposed timeline for touch points with the OSBT for the 2025 budget planning process. After the conversation about adding strategic budget guidance to our planning process came out of the OSBT retreat, staff considered what a new budget planning timeline, look, timeline might look like. The 2023 touch points are listed at the top and proposed 2024 touch points are listed at the bottom. A few key changes from last year to this year. Um, we're proposing, uh, we've already pulled the strategic budget guidance conversation out of the next year's CIP and operating budget update and are bringing that to you in January. We're proposing to change the revenue update and budget process overview in April from a written update and presentation to just a written update to set the groundwork for the May through July discussions. Then we'll keep May and June as written updates and presentations and public hearing will be held again in July. 
If there's additional information you request during this meeting, we'll make sure to address it in the May through July meetings. Okay. And so we'll close now with four questions to guide your discussion. We can go through these um, or there may be, so I'll, I'll read through them. These were also included in the memo. Um, the first question is, is there a particular tier one strategy the OSBT is interested in having a greater understanding of in terms of how OSMP is elevating this area? Is there a particular past or current strategic enhancement the OSBT is interested in having a greater understanding of? Is the OSMP, I'm sorry, is the OSBT interested in having a greater understanding of the city's SARE framework and how or why SARE is becoming an important consideration in budget and work plan development for city departments? And then because the department has already submitted the 2024 budget, does the OSBT wish to provide high level strategic guidance regarding accelerations for 2025 through 2026? So we hope that between uh, the retreat conversation and all of us having now, oh yeah, I remember that conversation <laughs> and having some connection back to our September conversation to today, we could uh, uh, sort of jump off of this presentation and turn it over to you to kind of see where things go. And again, this is sort of a pilot area. We've sort of haven't had this kind of discussion within a format like this is I, admittedly, I think we'd be feel better if we were all around a table and kind of having that conversation rather than this formal setting, but let's give it a try. Great. Thank you, Dan and Sam. Appreciate that. Um, what I'm going to suggest is that we work our way uh, through the questions, but before we do that, um, I wanted to uh, give Brady a, a chance that since you were integral to the budget conversation at the retreat, whether there's anything specifically that you'd like the board to focus on in its discussion or any other uh, comments or observations you have that might uh, move us along. Well, I'd just like to um, start off by just thanking you all for uh, coming back to us relatively quickly the very beginning of the year to open this up and being open to looking at how we've done things and, 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 and changing. So I just think that's exemplary. And, um, and I really appreciate that. And, and the way that you frame this as being an open conversation. And so I'm kind of imagining we're all around the table right now. So that's good. <laughs> um, I mean, I think we should, you all frame some questions. I have some other kind of questions that I'd like to at least pose. Maybe we don't resolve them tonight is fine, but however you want to, manage this um, and Michelle do you have anything that you wanted to make sure that we cover yes I I also just wanted to thank you all for putting this together I had to read this memo a couple of times to see like where this was going and um, my understanding is that you were providing us some well, first of all, I had to get my head around strategic enhancements. Mm -hmm. um, departmental priorities, it just seems more intuitive, intuitive to me, um, but I, I understand that you're using that terminology. I don't know when you switched it over, maybe around the master. Two years contract. ago, about, yeah. Two. So I had to kind of rewire my brain. Okay, these are the priorities that you're running with. Um, you make like one to two year investments in them and then they get operationalized over time. Um, and so you're all looking at your budget process in a multi-year sort of time frame. Um, when we've looked at the budget, it's been one year basically at a time. And that was my primary feedback at the retreat is like understanding where the department is headed, not just one year at a time, but having um, some, some sort of preview into the, 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 the out years. And so this has been helpful for me um, to understand at least in a two-year calendar time frame, so the memo goes through what you've done in the um, what you've targeted in the last couple of years, um, and then um, you listed out like twenty-four to twenty-five. Um, I'm curious to see like when you add the touch point. So you're going to subtract a touch point. But you're going to add a touch point later in the year where we actually go through the next two years, right? So what I'm curious is like, what's the delta between what you've listed here under 24 to 25, and then how do we chop that off into 25, 26, so that we can kind of get our head around, okay, we're going to be looking um, later at this year at what's happening in the next year prior to it 
right? Mm -hmm. 25, right? Mm -hmm. And then, um, and the year after. So we're going to be revisiting that in 24 before we jump into, yeah. So anyway, I think it's helpful. I, I'll be curious to see what it, what that Delta looks like, what you sort of conclude this year and what carries over to the following year. Yeah. So I, I think it's, it, it's helpful for me in that way. Yeah. Of yeah. Getting some, some visibility into the out years. Just a, just a quick, real quick response to that. Yeah. I mean, the amount of, you know, what, what, what is the time frame we're looking at here? So there's a, a few ways that to look at it from the staff perspective is, of course, from the CIP perspective, we're trying to look out over six years, right? And so uh, from an asset management standpoint, whether it's going to be a CIP project or fall within an operating budget, we're, we're, we're really challenging our staff in terms of their asset classes to be looking at a six-year time horizon. So we have that overall goal. It may not show, it may not show up in budgeting, uh, uh, and things like that, but we are as a staff trying to look further and further down the road in terms of, uh, prioritization of maintenance needs, capital needs, operating needs, and trying to push our limits and looking beyond just a single budget year. Um, so there is opportunities within these discussions to not sort of always pigeon us whole within a single budget year that, um, we could have conversations that might might finally show up in a budget two years from now or whatever like that, but it could have been spurred from a conversation we all have tonight, for instance. So um, I, I don't have any corrections or anything to offer what you were saying, but just to add a little bit to it, time frames of when discussions happen versus what's informing which budget and which years that uh, there's also that take away the annual budget cycle and there's that six year time horizon goal and then working backwards from there, so. Great. Uh, John, do you have any thoughts or uh, comments before we work our way through the questions? Uh, no, I, I really appreciated reading through this and I, I love this cadence of, you know, giving us a preview of what the strategic enhancements are. Um, I, I felt like uh, what y'all were planning was great and uh, look forward to getting this preview again in the future. And Harmon, um, do you have any thoughts? Sure. Um, so uh, I just continue to be impressed with um, the way we're using our master plan strategies, the way we're using our priorities from the planning documents to really influence how we budget. And I like the fact that the um, you know implementing those strategic enhancements is being done on a two-year basis rather than an annual basis because I think projects generally take a little bit longer to percolate and and I think it's a more reasonable time frame. And I think this, you know, obviously you're still gonna have to do annual budgeting, but to not have to rejigger what the priorities are, what strategic enhancements are every year is great. And, and I think it gives you a chance to kind of run projects to some completion point or some midpoint where you can decide, you know, is this strategic enhancement working? Should we reprioritize? Um, so all in all, you know, pretty impressed. Great, thanks. Um, and I'll just add, uh, I, again, appreciate the kind of the first crack at uh, what we were discussing at the retreat. I think this uh, lays some very good groundwork uh, for further conversations. My focus, uh, though, is on, will be on question three and the sustainability, equity, and resilience um, framework. I'm, I, I'm a little um, concerned that we we are kind of incorporating that before or in addition to um, the framework in my mind that is really critically important for a, a natural resource management agency. And, and that is um, you know, making sure that the land management, the, you know, the natural environment management is key. And so I'm, I'm just, a, a little hesitant to jump, uh, you know, full bore into a framework that, from my perspective, looks to be a little more bureaucratic and administrative, rather than the focus that I think we need to continue to have in the forefront, and that is, um, you know, managing the uh, valuable natural resources um, that we find on the system. So uh, I'll look forward to that conversation. Uh, with that, um, let's go to question one. And does anyone 
uh, have any comments or further discussion on question one? Could I just have a 20 second preamble to this? So how we frame these questions, just to kind of get you in our, in our frame is, uh, is that oh, it, uh, instead of uh, a trustee saying, why aren't we doing more with that? You should do more with that to first say, tell us a little bit more about how you're doing with that. Is, is, are you, is it a trend in which you're spending more resources on lately or less? So trying to frame it on and being less reactive and, and, and that sort of thing to like, let's under, this is an area that's important to us. Let's dive into it a little bit deeper. Can we talk about how staff has accelerated? What's the trend over time and to putting attention to that? So that's why we frame the conversation, uh, the questions the way they were is to try to build our collective understanding of an area that might be important to the trustees. And then based on that information, then start to say, okay, uh, you know, what else could we do here? Or boy, I didn't know we were doing all that stuff. That's great. Keep up the good work. You know, that kind of thing. So right. great. Thanks for the feedback. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, does anyone want to jump in on question <clears throat> one with either uh, observations, comments, or questions? Hearing nothing, <laughs> um, what I will then uh, offer is that, you know, the, uh, the question for me is, um, you know, the wildfire mitigation, um, you know, proposed uh, strategy. And again, um, my concern is that, and it's really critical that we do the, uh, you know, the planning that's the basis uh, for that. But um, I also am concerned about the, the use of the word mitigation in the sense of, um, you know, again, resource management or ecological management. Um, and so for me, the concern is on in that particular strategy that we not lose sight of, you know, what we need to be doing on the ground as far as uh, ma managing uh, those uh, forest and grassland areas. Um, because I, I think, uh, especially based on the, uh, the Marshall fire that there's a lot of community concern about hazard and risk. And in that conversation, there, there's not much room for talking about, you know, the ecological value of, of those, um, those resource areas. And so um, I would offer that that's a really important uh, strategy, but we as the open space and mountain parks department ought to keep in mind the, you know, the natural values that uh, need, need to be either protected or restored or, or managed um, in, as part of that whole strategy. Are there any other comments or suggestions as far as a specific tier one strategy that you might be interested in talking about further? Seeing none, um, let's go to question two. So is there a particular past or current strategy enhance enhancement that we're interested in having a greater understanding of? Are, are there some, yeah, Brady? Um, I've got a, a comment and maybe a few questions in this regard. So when, when I was reading this document, um, I had to get my head wrapped around some of our terminology, like mm -hmm. enhancements and accelerations within the context of a budget. I take that to mean additional spending. Mm. Um, is it, Generally, that's the case. And, and the thing that I, you know, whenever I'm looking at a budget, I'm wondering, well, what are we not doing? You know, where are, if, if our, we, everything can't be a priority, obviously, no matter how many dollars and people we have. And so as things become more of a priority, what's coming off? And um, I had to use the thesaurus for this, but what would be strategic uh, diminutions? I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yeah. Like, <laughs> what, what, what are the things we're not doing? What are the cuts we're making? And I think some of my, as a relatively new trustee, some of my discomfort in terms of being in charge of reviewing a budget and making a recommendation to council is, is feeling that I don't have a whole lot of visibility in the base budget that 
that what has gone on before and in um which is part of why i was interested in um in taking a look at this and so i have a hunger uh to 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 have some more visibility in that I'm, i'd be really curious to hear what you know what do we learn what programs do we launch or or what are we we cut there were a few places in the in the narrative in this memo that i caught where this is being transitioned from that or we're taking this position and morphing into that but um yeah, I just think we, we, it's, I think it's just the nature of, um, of our work that it's, it's much easier to add things on than it is to take away. And I think that makes our job ever more difficult over time in terms of enhancements too. I'd love to see metrics for success, um, that go beyond just, we, our goal is to launch this program. So we launch this program and that's the metric of success. Um, okay, so we launched the program. What what was the impact that we hoped it would have? And I think continuing to report on those for multiple years, even beyond the time when the enhancement would be considered to be active, presumably it remains enhanced over time. And I think having um, the three main ones that we have today, I'm just you know just kind of spitballing here, but maybe we report on them for the next six years, and and we just keep looking. You know, they they go further down the list, but you know, way back in 2024, we had the idea that we wanted to enhance these things. How did it, how did it go? Are, are those, are those expenditures still happening? And, and if, if so, how and why? Um, Brady, can, can I just jump in before please. you? Please, I'm sorry, I'm monologuing. Please. No, 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 uh, go on, because I do think there are a couple of examples of what you're talking about in the memo. And I just want to highlight those um, right. that might, you know, uh, provide a little more detail to what Brady's saying. So um, one of the accomplishments was uh, repurposing a vacant trail supervisor position in 2023 to serve as a third ranger supervisor. And so in my mind, Sam, when I read that, it's like, well, you know, we have been talking as a board about the importance of, you know, the trail maintenance effort um, by the department that, you know, trying to bring our trails up, up to a, you know, higher standard. And so what's up with that? You know, how, how is that actually fitting into, you know, that whole overall trail, um, uh, conver trail maintenance uh, conversation? And then um, Let's see. The other thing I was going to now I've forgotten what the, the other the other example was that um, I was. Oh no, I, I see it. So uh, on the next page, we're increasing the forestry crew from eight to thirteen, and and I think uh, in conjunction with Brady's observation on success metrics, it look it looks like that's you know bodies are kind of the measure. And for me, the, the measure, you know, would be much more substantive in the sense of, okay, what, did, what are we looking at to try to accomplish um, in any particular time frame? And so some of it might be acres, you know, some of it might be, you know, um, more, more um, uh, or higher quality of vegetation or wildlife habitat or s something like that. So from my perspective, it, it, bodies are important to get the work done, but getting the work done is really the key. Um, and so what work are we anticipating uh, having those bodies do? And I think, I, I, you know, I know that we're planning on and uh, our subsequent uh, touches at the budget of probably filling in some of that detail. But I think initially, um, in the strategic enhancement conversation, it's good to kind of um, have that goal or vision out there as uh, as part of the information that the board's considering, so that the board can, over the next few months, can give that some thought and then is prepared. Uh, when more detail comes up later in the year on the budget um, to talk more uh, intelligently about it. I don't know whether that was helpful or not, but uh, Brady, but I, I thought those were two examples that uh, yeah. would be helpful. And in making my comment, I didn't mean to insinuate we're not doing that in any way, by the way, but just, you know, mm -hmm. but um, so anyway, I, I've got a few other comments, but we can move forward through the, these questions okay. I'll, I'll chime in again later 
Uh, so is there any other comment or uh, question on question two? Uh, let's go to question three then. Um, and that's the one on the sustainability, equity, and uh, resilience framework that the city has developed that uh, we're trying to integrate the departmental budget into. And so are there some comments or observations on that? I had a, 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 com a question is, so right now all of our expenditures are linked back to some degree to our top tier strategies. And, and is every single penny linked to those or is there sort of a, I forget, is there sort of a other category? Um, so they are all linked to strat to master plan strategies. When we had the, when I showed the tier example, those are, uh, we exclude financial sustainability strategies from the master plan and those, um, those rolled up numbers because those aren't tiered, but yeah, we, we do um, link every penny to, to every, every plan. penny is every somehow reflected. Sorry. Yeah, got it. Every non-personnel penny right now. Okay. Looking yeah. to do personnel. And, and we're going to, and Brady, we do that through our work planning compass uh, tool from the city, citywide perspective in their open gov. Um, they're, they're not linking to our master plan or to other department master plans. They're, they're linking to the higher level guidance, such as the SARE framework or, or soon to be strategic, uh, the city's strategic plan. So that's a, at the department level, we are doing our own linking with our own tools. That Got is it. not a citywide approach. Okay. Yep. And now you're going to have to do that though with the SARE. Yeah. You want to yeah. talk a little bit about the linking there. And the so it, it, I guess my question is, to what extent is this really just sort of a multi-dimensional accounting exercise versus um, truly taking, you know, to what extent is Sarah gonna inform our decisions? And to what extent is this just another way that we have to, I understand we're having a little bit of a presentation disaster here. Um, and to what extent are, is, it, is it really kind of an accounting exercise? Where we're like, well, that we're doing this stuff and now we have to kind of link it to, not only our top tier strategies, but all SIR strategies. Yeah, from the from the citywide perspective, uh, uh, budget for resilience is is the uh, title of, of of an initiative that began, I would say, two or three years ago, and they laid out incremental steps of getting us to the point where we're linking to KPIs, outcome measurement metrics. On okay, so we're doing this. We we sort of put all the accounting balls and we have matched them all up. That's great, but now then what? And, mm -hmm. and so this is the year where we're gonna start from a citywide perspective is to develop uh, KPIs and sort of some metric and some measurements to then so we could sort of inform well, do these level of investments of all these uh, uh, budget items that we've linked to this sort of SARE framework theme or whatever, is it having any impact? And so the goal of the city is to eventually have these tools be able to be measured for success. That's that's the goal. But right now, over the past couple of years, we're still sort of lining up all the budget balls and putting them uh, in, in into the appropriate best matched groups so that we can then start to put some, uh, develop some met metrics and more. Um, is that a good way yeah, of summarizing? I think so. And I'll just add to that too. I think um, the SARE framework is through the 20 up to the 2024 budget has been used at a really high level. And so um, the city defines what we consider our divisions. We are calling programs in the budgeting process. So most of our divisions will line up to those programs. So for instance, trails and facilities is a program area. We link one of the SARE goals and the objectives under that to that program area. So every, every program area is just linked to one SARE goal. Um, so it's not gonna be as detailed right now as, as what we do with the master plan and tying it to each of the individual strategies. So it's, it's more at like a high level. Mm -hmm. So every dollar that's spent toward trails and facilities is going to be linked to whatever SARE goal it's been identified with. Um, so I think it's, it's just that it is at that higher level. I, I might, we might be going to a little bit of a lower level for 2025. And I think that's also where um, the citywide strategic plan is also gonna come in at some point for that too. Is, is this, we, one of the comment, one of the things we kind of talked about at the retreat 
Uh, and with all due respect to all of the many hours that went into our many plans is that we have a lot of plans. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing evidence of more plans coming down the pike. Um, it, and, and do you see this, do, do you see greater and greater complexity in terms of getting, you know, direction? We've got all of the, the trail study areas, you know, our stuff within our department, we got a citywide strategic plan coming down the pike. We've got SARE. It just seems like there's, that's a lot. Yeah, it's, but it's also a, uh, it's also part of a, of, of a trend that actually began several, several years ago. It's basically the goal, I guess I'd basically describe it as the city of Boulder has had a history of being highly, highly decentralized that every department was sort of operating on their own in silo. And so a one Boulder approach began, I would several years ago, uh, even, you know, ever since I became director in 2018, that's the, let's move to a one Boulder approach. And so every year we've been incrementally moving towards that each department is sort of linked to a to a an overall uh framework if you will and that that decentralized while there's elements of it which could be great it also you could, you could see yourself as where i fit within i the i department fits within the overall vision of where we're going as a city so um yes there is the strategic plan is the next step and the next sort of tool to be put in place but it has been sequenced, so it's just not like all coming out as out of the blue. This has been sort of an ongoing conversation, and every year the budget for resilience began about three or four years ago, and that's moving more granular as it proceeds. and And the strategic plan is just that other tool, that other step that needs to be put in place. So, because the SARE framework is so high level, it's one step down from that. So, how we link to that is is just the next step. So. I, I, I don't see it quite the way you do, but I can understand uh, looking into it, how it could be like, oh boy, this is where we're going with this. Well, I was more curious to see your perspective and it sounds like yeah. things are proceeding as they should and the departments within the city are getting more integrated and you see that as a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that as long as, and it, it does exist, the spirit of, you know, we want each department to be strong and, and doing the best work that they do for their for their sphere. I mean, it's, it's not like that, that needs to be taken away or is there's any desire to do that, but then how does it link up? Wildfire is a great example. Uh, before two or three years ago, you know, there was some staff level conversations like Brian Oliver and Burton Stoner knew each other and they would talk, but the amount of integration that is now happening between various departments and agencies on wildfire is that classic example is that we are all doing something. We just weren't as integrated and sort of strategizing together on those things. So on, on these common theme areas that we could plug into at the citywide level, I think it's basically is let's talk folks, let's get together at the budget, the work planning uh, perspective, and that's what you're starting to see. Yeah, there's gonna be certain things that we do on an ongoing basis that don't touch other departments that probably will never be called out in terms of, hey, you know, why can we do that as a citywide thing? I mean. A lot of work we do is, you know, we're charged with doing it. No one else is really that involved in it. But things like equity, wildfire, uh, youth education, all those things, many other department staff or city staff touch that. And how can we all come together to do a better job of it and prioritize our budgeting in that way? That's sort of the idea. Thank you. So my cautionary observation, Dan, in that regard, it, it, it just feels a little like you know, kind of multi-layering layering or piling on. And so for me, you know, I certainly can support, you know, an integrated city approach and, and kind of uh, and more unified uh, planning. But the concern I have is whenever we use or whenever a framework like this is used, I think it's incumbent on us in the budget cycle to demonstrate how that framework helped or was effective in our accomplishing whatever it is that we said that we wanted to do, you know, within within that framework. Um, it, it, it just feels a little right now, and maybe it's because I don't really, 
know in any great detail about what it's doing, but it just feels now um, a little like, you know, kind of a, uh, a context that uh, may not be as uh, applicable to, um, you know, natural resource management as we might want it to be. Mm -hmm. So anyway, the cautionary note is that I think it's incumbent on us in these budget conversations to make sure that whatever the overall our overarching plan or the framework or whatever that is, how is it that that's helping us accomplish what we as a resource management agency um, have as the priorities? So um, I guess that's my cautionary note. And tell me uh, what a KPI is. Key performance indicator. Yeah. I don't know if Michelle's mic was on, so it's a key performance indicator. Great. I have a, a comment on that third bullet. Right. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, I, you know, I heard uh, Dave's concern about getting wrapped up in the bureaucratic process and Brady's concern about too many plans. Um, and I, I think it, the answer is yes to the third bullet. We'd love to have a greater, under, I would love to have a greater understanding of how the city's <laughs> SER framework is becoming a consideration in our budgeting. Um, I think I, I heard um, a preview of that last month with uh, Brian Anaker's team's presentation about climate change. And, you know, he really, and his team really showed us how um, you can use sustainability and resilience and even equity considerations to combat climate change on our, on our public lands. And so, you know, if, if we have a unique way of applying the SER framework to the land management that, that Dave Kuntz is so, you know, obviously concerned about in your question. Um, I, I'd love to see how that that's playing out because it was very interesting to, um, to see how by focusing on those areas, we could improve the landscape and um, reduce the impacts of climate change here in Boulder. And, and even as we discovered on the agricultural properties um, to the east of us. So yeah, the, the simple answer is yes. We'd love to hear more. I'd love to hear more. I shouldn't speak for the board. Um, I, I think everyone else said it really well, but I, I will also add, I would love to hear more about how we're, you know, uh, using SIR and, you know, considering it in the budget. Um, I've been here long enough. I feel like I have a good sense of, you know, how we tie everything to tier one strategies, but SIR is definitely a new thing. And I think it would be great for the, the board to get a better understanding of how we're considering that. So is, uh, is that helpful? Yes, thank you. That's, that's a, a good level of guidance for us to go back and start to plan for those April through July meetings. Great. Um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll still go to question four. <laughs> <that's what> <laughs> <I was gonna laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, sure. So uh, do we have any suggestions? Um, or guidance as far as uh, the upcoming uh, budget conversation? Michelle, I think you were yeah. um, anxious to do that. <laughs> yeah, so my answer to that question would be yes. And that goes to like having visibility into the pipeline. Um, in the past, I have not felt like I've, like we really had real say in the budgeting process because like these things were already sort of set to happen. And so have, and my experience on, on Parks and Rec Advisory Board, we actually had the ability to build a park earlier by looking into the out years and saying, why aren't we not funding that park? And it would, and solve for those components and then we're able to build a park. I don't, don't feel like we have that level of influence on this board, or at least we haven't, because we haven't had that visibility. Um, so um, absolutely, I feel like, you know, and that was a CIP matter, um, but that we were able to pull in, but also on the operating expense um, budget, just having visibility and, and the strategic enhancements that you have in mind for the out years, I think will be helpful in having a bigger picture um, view of how we're spending our money and in investing our money. I like to jump on that. I think Michelle makes a great point. And um, I, I, I love that you are retweaking the, the budget planning and, and the touches that we're going to get. And I just would also ask once again, that we, um, 
we, we did get P&Ls, but they were really late in the game to my recollection last time. And I understand that your chart of accounts is pretty complicated, but I would love to see a P&L that has the appropriate level of granularity so we can get a really good idea of, you know, uh, relative investment FTEs within various departments and initiatives and how that's been trending in the past and how we see it trending in the next few years. I think that's just kind of a more specific way of, of saying what Michelle was. And, and, and if we see that in April, presumably we have an opportunity to, to provide some in, input that um, might actually have an Im, impact on the outcome in the subsequent year. Um, so I am, I'm hungry personally for numbers uh, and, and, and to be able to put some quality time in with some financials and, and really get my head wrapped around where these 30 some million dollars are, are going every year and, and how our, um, how our priorities are reflected in that. So thank you. Other comments? Um, so I have a, another comment. I, I, I do want to, um, definitely support the enhanced presence on, on the system. I, I think that, um, you know, that with the increasing recreation and, and, you know, potential impacts and our, our having a presence out there uh, and being effective in that uh, is extremely important. Um, and especially in kind of the urban context that we're in, um, that uh, we necessarily have to have, you know, a, a heightened uh, pres presence out there. Um, and a couple of other things, I guess, I, I am hoping that in my mind, uh, there are two real key elements um, that the department really needs to be paying attention to on the ground, in addition to uh, having more boots on the on the ground. And that is you know, the proliferation of non-native species throughout the system. I, I just don't think that we can uh, let that go um, because I think that there's an increasing um, impact of, of uh, non-native species um, uh, throughout the system. And then the other thing is, and that we've talked about this a lot over the years, is that we, I think we still need to have the trail maintenance issue in front of us at all times. Um, because I think, again, the potential for losing ground um, as we focus on other uh, priorities in the department is, uh, you know, is high. And the, the fact of the matter is, is that the state of the trails system, I think, is the real you know, commentary on the state of, um, of the department's management uh, on the ground from many people's perspective. And so I think those two things um, we should not lose sight of. And I, I would strongly urge us to um, uh, have those, uh, you know, prioritized as, as well. Um, because the potential to get further and further behind and eventually then not really be able to recover, I think in both those instances is high. So with that. Well uh, said, Dave. Thank you. Um, are there any anything else that you would like the board to? Um, no, I think the, comments on? this has been helpful. Just I, I do want to go back to one of the comments that a strategic enhancement uh, would normally always equate to sort of more spending. And actually, that could be the case. Uh, the wildfire is an example where we put more boots on the ground with more forestry crew. But in the, uh, actually, with a couple of these enhancements, more presence in the field is not a, a green light for staff to suddenly flood myself and the director's team with staffing requests. Um, but instead, it's like, how do we use existing staff more strategically? How could we communicate better between the rangers and the education and outreach staff and our volunteer groups and to collaborate where we want to be at certain times of the day or certain days of the week? That's not a budgetary item. That's more of a let's collaborate and talk more and come up with some creative solutions. So uh, and then also the planning uh, acceleration for uh, this year there could be some budgetary impacts coming out of that strategic enhancement, but it's more about how do we look further down the pipeline? How do we 
uh, beef up our asset management program? How do we build a planning framework for the future? Again, they probably aren't going to tie to a budget request or a budget increase. Um, so I just wanted to kind of go back to that, that yes, sometimes they do result in we just physically need more money to build more barrier fencing, or we need to get an agricultural restoration crew out on the lands to restore these lands. So, and we don't have them. So we need to, you know, bring them on. So it's, it's both. And, um, uh, but it's not always an enhancement doesn't always equate to a budget enhancement. So I just wanted to kind of circle back to that one. Great. Well, listen, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we really appreciate um, you're taking the lead on this and especially uh, I, I want to add um, my personal appreciation that uh, the conversation at the board meeting in October that uh, you, you know, uh, ran with that and I think this is a good beginning for the conversations that we will be having um, in the next few months. So um, well, how I see this conversation is that it's really informing the board kind of preliminarily to be prepared for some more specific um, uh, detailed direction and uh, proposals uh, in the subsequent discussions. So uh, we really appreciate your efforts and look forward to talking further. Great. So thank, you. thank you. All right. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. Okay. Um, do anyone have any further concluding observations? Are we ready to move on? Uh, so let us do that and we will move on to the, um, the staff's presentation, uh, on the requests from the utilities department for yeah. the disposal of open space. We're going to get set up here with Bethany and Don joining me up here. And then also, uh, Joe Tadeucci from utilities department will probably grab a seat a little closer to the mic in case there's any questions. Uh, for him as we uh, go off the presentation and into uh, um, um, some board uh, questions. Um, yeah, so we do have a, a, a presentation queued up and of course you all received a pretty extensive memo. And I'll start off by saying as we start to get prepared and get the presentation up that um, one of our goals was, um, was to as quickly as we can assemble the information that we, that we got uh, through the uh, formal request for the use of open space lands on December 15th, and which came with a bunch of information. There's also been a lot of project information that has come forth over the years and that has been presented to this board. And so we wanted to, uh, from that December 15th request to tonight, is, you know, as quickly as we could to try to assemble that information for you all uh, to help support uh, late February and then March's uh, uh, board deliberations and, and consideration. So the spirit was, is that tonight is all about, you know, we've done our, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the best job we could over the last few weeks in assembling the information. How did we do? And, and we'll go through some of the uh, questions uh, uh, related to that. But uh, with that, I'm joined by uh, Bethany Collins, our senior manager for real estate services and Don D'Amico. Um, who is our senior resources project manager, and then of course director of utilities Joe Tadiucci, uh down in the audience still. So um, with that, I think we'll queue up the uh, presentation, and I think we can probably go to the next slide. Yeah. So uh, what is the goal for tonight? Uh, our goal was to uh, we put the memo out to you and to describe how the information in the OSBT memo is organized. We were very intentional and wanting to bring certain elements into the memo and how we organize the topic areas. And we'll go through that. We wanted to summarize the request uh, that we received from utilities and its relations to the license and disposal guidance document. That guidance document is one of the areas that we really looked as a framing uh, document for how we are assembling all the information because that uh, guidance document was reviewed and sort of accepted by this board in 2022. So that was, that's, that's a foundational document that we're considering. Uh, uh, mainly Don, uh, Bethany and then Don will summarize the mitigation project and the monitoring plan. Uh, and then uh, perhaps uh, as importantly as anything else, we're gonna describe the next steps and timelines in terms of uh, considering this request and, and what lies ahead over the next couple of months. 
I do just want to emphasize tonight that uh, there will is no staff recommendation before you, uh, and there's no deliberation and consideration tonight on the request itself from utilities. And then at the end, we will pose a few questions to help us better prepare you all and staff for uh, 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 future meetings that, that are ahead. So that's sort of our uh, outline for our, our next 20 minutes in terms of a presentation. And with that, we'll go to the next slide and turning things over to Bethany. Thanks, Dan. Um, <clears throat> good evening, trustees. I'm very tall in this chair. I'm tall. <laughs> 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 um, uh, so let's dive right into the memo and uh, a bit, which is generally structured. Can you hear? Yes. I'm just far away from it. Can't get down. <laughs> Shoulders. I know. Okay. Um, I'll just lean. <laughs> okay. So um, the memo is generally structured to outline the elements of the request uh, and associated matters, um, as well as how the request falls within the framework of the of OSMP's license and disposal guidance. Um, additionally, we'll be touching on the parallel annexation application related to the flood project. Uh, the major elements of the request from utilities include some general details on the flood mitigation project. Uh, identification of the areas of the Van Vliet open space and CU South properties associated with the flood project and information on the mitigation project and annexation related to the flood project. The request and memo generally follow the OSMP's license and disposal guidance, including details on the impacts and benefits of the proposed transfer, alternatives, value and cost information, specifics on the mitigation project, uh, and monitoring and alignment with the June 2021 OSBT resolution and CU South annexation agreement. Next slide, please, Leah. So uh, touching on various elements of the request from utilities. Next slide, please. Um, so let's get our bearings first. I've recently realized um, that the open space land in this area has never been identified as the Van Vliet open space until now. This nomenclature of referring to our properties after the grantee or seller tends to be internal to OSMP for ease of overall property identification. The open space parcel we're looking at is part of a large complex of properties north and south of Highway 36 acquired from the Van Vliet family in the late 1970s and is east of the approximately 300 acres, CU, uh, C, 300 acre, excuse me, CU South property owned, currently owned by the University of Colorado. Next slide, please. As a brief overview, the city of Boulder's South Boulder, South Boulder Creek flood mitigation project, which is managed by utilities, includes a flood wall or spillway, outlet works, detention area, and groundwater conveyance system infrastructure. This is the first phase of the three phase plan approved by city council in 2015, and is also included and in prioritized in the CU South guiding principles in the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. This phase is intended to protect life and safety by addressing flooding in the area known as the West Valley via construction of a, a regional detention facility and flood wall upstream of Highway 36. As designed, it will provide flood protection for approximately 2,500 residents and 260 structures, which includes 1,100 dwelling units, approximately. Next slide, please. Tonight's request centers on, and I'm sorry, you can see the, the blue in these two well, or the colors in these two well, but they are also in your memo, the same figures in your memo. Uh, tonight's request centers on the need to construct some of the spillway infrastructure for the flood mitigation project on an approximately 2.2 acre portion of the city's Van Fleet open space property, which is managed by the Open Space and Mountain Parks Department. The location of the spillway is necessitated by the site's to topography, including the elevation of US 36, as well as the location of existing utilities. Initial conceptual design estimates, for those of you who remember, uh, for potential open space land needed for the project were approximately, was approximately five acres. And utility staff has worked diligently with OSMP staff and consultants and with OSBT and council input to narrow the permanent use area to approximately 2.2 acres. Next slide, please, Leah. Additionally, the permanent use footprint has been decreased through understanding that approximately 1.9 acres of the open space property will only be needed temporarily for construction 
and then be restored except for an ongoing access route of use to both utilities for periodic maintenance activities and OSMP for agricultural enforcement and other land management act access. This makes the combined permanent footprint, permanent and temporary use area about 4.1 acres. Again, down from the early estimates of five acres. Also, this temporary area will remain under OSMP management and the portion that will continue as an access route will be of minimum width and surface material necessary for periodic vehicle and equipment access. Next slide, please, Leah. If the transfer of the use and management of the 2.2 acre transfer area is approved, the flood project is able to fully, and the, project, the flood project is able to be fully permitted. The land transfer elements of the CU South annexation agreement will become available, which includes conveyance of 155 acres of the CU South property to the city with 80 acres being at no cost and an additional 75 acres to be paid for using utilities enterprise funds. The flood project requires about 36 acres of land and the remaining 119 will be designated for OSMP management for open space purposes. This 119 acres is what's known as the OSO site due to its, BBC, its Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan designation as open space other. In addition to this OSO site, 30.2 uh, shares of the Dry Creek number two ditch water rights will be uh, acquired by the city and managed by OSMP to support the mitigation project that we'll be discussing and allow for future management and irrigation needs within the ditches service area. While the OSO site and water rights will be under the general management of OSMP, utilities will have the performance obligations associated with the mitigation project on the OSO site until the restoration goals and permit requirements have been completed consistent with the capital improvement project and terms of the interdepartmental agreements we'll be discussing. Again, these acquisitions will not be carried out until the flood project is approved, which is contingent on the use of the transfer area for the project. Next slide, please. As I've just detailed, the OSO site is planned to be used as the mitigation site for the project impacts. The diagram shows the mitigation design that Don will further detail later. Can you pivot to the next slide, please, Leah? As with most of OSMP managed land, this portion of Van Vliet open space is not located within city Boulder city limits. So additionally, and in parallel with this request, utilities for, is pursuing annexation of the approximately 4.1 acres of the OSMP property utilized for the flood project and possibly a portion of the CDOT right of way. So the entire project will be located within the city. This would reduce jurisdictional complexities and is consistent with provisions of the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. To be clear, this is separate from the CU South annexation process and would not include provisions of urban services or things like that. Because the proposed annexation area is currently open space, OSBT will also be asked to provide a recommendation on the proposed annexation consistent with the charter, which requires a recommendation from OSBT on any open space elements of the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. One correction from the memo I'd like to uh, mention is that approval of the annexation would not be contingent on approval of the transfer of the 2.2 acre transfer area. If the transfer is not approved and the annexation is, uh, the property could remain annexed or could be de-annexed. Moving on, oh, sorry, <laughs> next slide, please. Uh, moving on to how the request is to be considered within the framework of OSMP's license and disposal guidance for OSMP staff to provide a recommendation on a disposal or transfer request. We consider the impacts and benefits to the open space land, charter purposes and resources, as well as to the general public. Um, what alternatives may be available, how impacts might be mitigated or restored, um, and other site or project specific information consistent with the department's license and disposal guidance. Here we'll summarize some of the information assembled in the context of the guidance. So some of the impacts that have been identified to be associated with the transfer request include approximately 2.2 acres of open space land permanently transferred for use and management by utilities for placement of utility infrastructure. 
approximately 1.9 acres of open space land temporarily disturbed during construction and partially restored for ongoing periodic access needs. Resource impacts, including wetlands, habitat for threatened species, and science, uh, scenic and viewshed impacts. Alteration of the existing public use patterns on the approximately 155 acres of the CU South property that will be conveyed to the city due to the construction activities associated with the flood and mitigation projects. For example, the CU levy, which currently supports a walking trail used by the public under CU ownership, will be removed as part of the mitigation project. Some of the benefits identified to be associated with the transfer request include acquisition of approximately 119 acres of land to be restored and managed for open space purposes, acquisition of 30.2 shares of Dry Creek number two ditch, water rights, Dry Creek ditch number two, sorry, I keep getting it wrong, <laughs> water rights to be used for mitigation project and other open space purposes, flood protection for approximately 2,500 residents and 260 structures, adding significant acreage to the OSMP system in the South Boulder Creek uh, floodplain, uh, and establishing floodplain connectivity, reducing habitat fragmentation, and improved hydrological function by removing the existing flood levy. Next slide, please. Under the guidance where impacts will occur, the requester is to detail how mitigation and or restoration might be possible. In this case, some temporary imp impacts within the 1.9 acre construction footprint will be restored under OSMP guidance to be outlined in the terms of the temporary construction IDMOU. This is consistent with third party project work all over the OSMP system. Additionally, contouring and restoration that can occur on the US 36 side and visual design and painting that can occur on the OSMP side of the flood wall will help mitigate scenic viewshed impacts. Also, the impacts of the wetlands and upland habitat will be mitigated on the OSO site in coordination with OSMP staff, as Don will de detail next. Next slide, please. Thanks, it's all you. Um, so I'm going to talk about the mitigation project, mitigation um, and monitoring um, parts of this flood project. Hey, Don, can you get closer to the microphone? Maybe I'll turn this on to yeah, and turn it on. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Um, so mitigation is required by regulatory agencies to compensate for the unavoidable loss of resources as a result of the project. In this case, the regulated resources include uh, wetlands that are regulated by the city of Boulder under their wetland protection ordinance and Preble's Meadow Jumping Mouse and Ute Ladies Tresses Orchid Habitat regulated by the US Fish and Wildlife Service under the Endangered Species Act. Mitigation independent of that required in environmental permits is also a condition of transfer of open space land to utilities. These requirements will increase the amount of habitat created, restored, or enhanced beyond what is typically uh, set by city code or federal regulations. Next slide. So the list of important environmental resources in the project area is extensive. I mentioned uh, two species listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act, uh, Preble's Meadow Jumping Mouse and Ute Ladies Tresses Orchid. And there are other species of concern, uh, conservation concern, including Northern Leopard Frogs, uh, Bobolinks, which are species of uh, ground nesting, uh, grassland nesting birds, and Plains Top Minnow, which occur in South Boulder Creek. The area also has some of the most productive agricultural lands in the open space system uh, used for grazing cattle and hay production. And so in a nod to the ecological diversity and unique species and communities along South Boulder Creek, the State of Colorado Natural Areas Program designated South Boulder Creek as a natural area in 1999. Uh, it qualifies as a state natural area because not only uh, the presence of the these rare species, but also in recognition of a number of important biological communities, including uh, remnants of um, uh, plains cottonwood riparian ecosystems, tall grass prairie ecosystems, and ecologically significant, significant wetlands, which are among the most diverse and best preserved in the region. So um, minimizing impacts and compensating for, the, for these impacts uh, that are unavoidable are major objectives of the um, mitigation project. Next slide. 
so using data we've collected over the years, um, open spaces collected over the years and supplemented with recent resource surveys by the city's consultants. We prepared this resource inventory map to identify important resources in the project area, both on open space land and on CU, uh, CU property. We use this information in project planning for everything from just providing a detailed understanding uh, of where all the resources are found to permitting to developing our mitigation plan. Next slide. Uh, figure four in the memo shows the area along US 36 where the impacts to open space will occur. We focus a lot of our energy and attention in this area where many of the resources I just mentioned are located and where the spillway is gonna be proposed. <laughs> open space and utility staff have been working with the consultants to reduce impacts to op open space resources by doing everything from uh, realigning the spillway to be closer to the CDOT right of way uh, to identifying construction methods that will um, shrink the construction footprint and phasing of the project to further reduce impacts. Next slide. Oops. We've also been working with the city's consultants to design mitigation to compensate for impacts that are unavoidable. So we started out by developing these goals uh, that were used to guide us through the design process. So as you can see here, um, three major goals are to create or enhance existing wetlands, uh, to create or enhance existing uplands that support uh, both prebles, metal jumping mice, and ute ladies, trusses, orchids, and uh, removing the existing levee to provide better ecological con connectivity in the floodplain. So this diagram here uh, just really graphically shows the design elements of the mitigation project. And what we've, what we've uh, attempted to do is recreate natural features and habitats that are common in floodplains along the Colorado Front Range. These include wet meadows, uh, willow shrublands, emergent marshes, and uh, native grasslands arranged in a matrix of um, uh, habitat types to maximize habitat for the species that I've mentioned. A uh, very important part of the project will be to remove the flood control levy on the CU property that separates the CU property from open space. And the purpose of removing it is to reduce the fragmentation of habitat between open space and CU property and um, to just improve overall floodplain connectivity. Next. So uh, monitoring is also required as a condition of in, in the environmental permits. It's really necessary to ensure that the mitigation is meeting all of our project goals. We have both regulatory monitoring as dictated by um, our required environmental permits and also monitoring required in the MOU, the IDMOU, um, and specifically for the groundwater uh, conveyance system. It's gonna be critical to maintain groundwater hydrology in the area because hydrology really is the driving force um, to maintain these wetlands and other habitats in the floodplain. And the, the groundwater conveyance system, this part of the project is designed to allow groundwater to flow freely through the spillway foundation uh, through a series of pipes and valves um, built into the sea camp pile wall. Uh, so as far as the uh, monitoring of that system, um, Brian Anaker, the open space science officer, and I began discussing a study design last year to monitor groundwater um, and the resources that are affected by it. And we recently engaged the broader open space science technical team to uh, develop a draft monitoring plan for the system that includes a real statistically robust uh, study design meant to identify uh, whether there are any changes to open space resources above and below US 36 that can be attributed to the project. We've narrowed it down to a uh, before after control and impact study, BACI for short, where we establish vegetation plots in the groundwater influence zone um, above and below US 36 and also in a control area outside of the area of influence. So we'll monitor vegetation and groundwater uh, before and after the project is built to see if we're seeing any statistically significant changes and biologically significant changes to open space resources. 
we're still working through the, uh, the details of the design, like sample size, randomization, other statistical details. And we plan to have everything in place to begin monitoring early this summer before the project begins. In the unlikely event that the system doesn't operate as designed, we'll use uh, adaptive management, like we do in a lot of our um, work on open space to correct any deficiencies. Adaptive management options may include repair or modification of the system, extending the monitoring term, um, acquiring additional water rights for the properties, or creating additional mitigation. So I'm going to turn it back over to Bethany to continue with the license and disposal. Next slide, please. Um, so the license and disposal guidance also allows for additional information to be provided or requested that's specific to a given site or project. Um, in this case, the OSBT resolution that I mentioned earlier, as well as the CU South Annexation Agreement, include re relevant information. At the June 9th, 2021 meeting, the OSBT approved a resolution to forward the city council detailing conditions um, the board wanted to be fulfilled or addressed to its satisfaction prior to considering a disposal or transfer of any open space property for the flood project. Um, while the resolution expresses conditions sought by OSBT at that stage of the project, uh, the process set forth in the charter requires a staff recommendation be made on disposal or transfer before the board can impose conditions on the disposal or transfer terms. Um, in the memo, staff has provided detail on how the conditions of the resolution have been or will be addressed, uh, particularly in consideration of the timeline and triggers specific to the CU South annexation agreement and permitting processes. Um, additionally, as mentioned during this presentation, the, the CU South annexation agreement approved after the resolution outlined specific milestones for conveyance of land and water and incorporates terms that align with the resolution related to future potential development of the CU site, CU South site, excuse me. Of particular importance uh, here is that the city cannot acquire land and water rights from CU uh, until utilities has a fully approved flood mitigation project. Um, and since the flood project requires the approximately 2.2 acre portion of open space land, this transfer must be approved. Uh, for further permitting and land conveyance to progress. Next slide, please. I use the term transfer a lot here <laughs> um, rather than disposed because title to all open space land is held by the city of Boulder, not OSMP. So this request is to transfer use and management to another city department. This is accomplished via interdepartmental agreements or IDMOUs. But as outlined in BRC 8811, the transfer between departments must still comply with the disposal process set forth in the city charter. This process is further necessary to allow for the flood project because uh, section 176 prohibits open space land from being approved after acquisition, unless such improvements are necessary to protect or maintain the land or provide for certain open space purposes. Additional recommendations that will be sought during the consideration of this request, I did mention the annexation, um, consistent with section 175 of the charter, our recommendation on the acquisition of the 119 acres of land and water rights, um, and a recommendation on the annexation of the open space land used for the flood project. Next slide, please. As we've referenced several times, uh, the land and water conveyances and matters related to the mitigation project and temporary uses of open space will be outlined in several interdepartmental agreements or memorandums of understanding. <clears throat> conveyance, the conveyance interdepartmental agreement is related to permanent transfer of use manage, of use or management of the use and management, excuse me, of the transfer area to utilities and acquisition of the OSO site and water rights for OSMP management, as well as ongoing access rights on the OSMP property, and will include terms and responsibilities related to ongoing maintenance access needs and provisions for reversion if the transfer area is no longer used or needed by utilities in the future. Um, I did hear somebody from the public comment earlier about the use of permanent, so we can certainly just talk about the use and management and that there's a reversion clause in our, in our next, in our follow-up memos. Um, the mitigation and monitoring interdepartmental agreement is related to the mitigation project design and construction on the OSO site and monitoring the groundwater conveyance system and mitigation project success. 
As Don detailed, it will also include adaptive management options for the groundwater conveyance system and other monitoring um, efforts. The temporary construction IDMOU is related to the use of the temporary construction area during the flood project um, and provisions for restoration of the area under OSMP guidance. This includes revegetation, weed control, and, and other um, disturbance, we, we call it disturbance and restoration um, terms that are consistent with projects around the OSMP system. And now I'll toss it over to Dan to talk about next steps and ask some questions. Yeah, just two more slides left. And uh, just uh, I'll bring the presentation home by uh, describing uh, what the next steps are. Um, so tonight, obviously, is just a daylight uh, as much of the information that we could and structured in a way that we hope you were able to follow and that made some sense. Um, and uh, the next steps are is that we will be holding a joint uh, public hearing uh, with City Council on February 22nd. And what that night will consist of is we will have a uh, staff presentation in which we will also provide our staff recommendation. Uh, we will then invite clarifying questions after the presentation and that the mayor will then open it up for... Your mic is off. Oh, my mic is off. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. Um, that, and then the mayor will open it up for uh, a public hearing at that point. We're expecting a, a pretty robust public hearing. Uh, and so that meeting will conclude after the public he uh, hearing. And then each uh, body will then deliberate and consider uh, the staff recommendation on its own. So uh, the OSBT at its regular business meeting on March 13th will uh, consider and deliberate on the staff recommendation. And if they do ap approve uh, the transfer, they will set forth a recommendation to council. And so then council will actually be considering uh, OSBT's recommendation as well at the March 21st uh, uh, city council meeting. And they will have their own deliberation and consideration on the matter at that meeting. So sort of a three pronged, three meeting process uh, starting in late February and then going into uh, the, the middle of March. So that's what's in, uh, in store. Uh, so more memo re uh, reading and more memo writing. So um, if we can go to the final slide. Uh, so uh, in the spirit of what we hope to accomplish tonight is to uh, look ahead to those meetings. And so these questions are more geared towards that. So is the information presented in the memo structured and organized in a way whereby trustees can access the information that they need? Is there information not included in this memo and presentation that trustees feel is needed in order to consider the, the transfer request in accordance with the disposal provisions of the Boulder City Charter and the license and disposal guidance? And do the trustees have questions related to the upcoming process and timeline that we've laid out? So just some guiding questions for you all. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dave. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that was a, a very helpful and instructive um, presentation. And I also think the memo was very helpful. Um, and so I'm expecting that we'll have a, a energetic discussion and uh, we'll entertain some uh, clarifying questions first. Um, so and then we can go to the three questions um, that, that the staff has posed, but are, does anyone have any kind of preliminary uh, thoughts or suggestions or questions that we need to make sure that we cover? Are we okay with moving ahead? Uh, John? Uh, I had one question. I think okay. Now, now is the appropriate time. Um, on page, uh, what page is this? 27. Uh, you read it out loud. It talked about the June 9th, 2021 resolution, and it says uh, that set forth in charter section 171C requires a staff recommendation on disposal before the board can impose conditions on the disposal and transfer terms. Um, this almost reads like it's a legal opinion saying that, you know, this, uh, this resolution doesn't carry any weight. Um, you know, I guess question one is, is that the case? Is that the official opinion? Two, um, it would be great to get clarification on this in, in the final packet. Uh, it would be great to give some clarity to the public. While we've done a great job here, you know, 
indicating how all of these have been met and I appreciate, you know, all the work that's been done here. It would be great to, to make sure we have some clarity on, you know, uh, you know, if, if we need to meet these um, and so that there's no ambiguity around, uh, you know, if, if we've met them or not, or need to meet them in the future. Great. Um, do you have any response or the question uh, presumably um, could be included in the uh, yeah, so, February 22nd presentation, which I think is probably a very appropriate uh, forum for that, but you might opine uh, preliminarily to us on uh, kind of your thoughts. Yeah, so um, uh, obviously we do not have uh, attorney representation um, or, or guidance to provide um, at this meeting um, or in response to your, your initial question. Um, we have had review and feedback on, on this particular memo as to um, that, that particular opening paragraph, which is, you know, the charter sets out a specific process, which is a staff recommendation has to be made in order, and then count, and then board has to, you know, there's, there's not really a, a process of they, you know, talking about a request and putting conditions on before they even consider that request. Um, and so following, if you follow our charter guidance, it's a staff recommendation needs to be made, board needs to be able to consider and make a recommendation and, and approval. So there's two prong approach there. Um, and then council in order to, for council to be able to, to act on, on a disposal or transfer. Um, so following that again, uh, we could we could say it's it's not um, it doesn't follow a charter process, but I'll get feedback to put in the memo or the presentation on uh, general legality that you're asking about. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, I might uh, add to the add to that as well. I think Michelle and I were the two board members at the time that uh, participated in that. And uh, John, my sense of the resolution or board resolutions in general, that one specifically is that it was intended to provide uh, some guidance and direction uh, both to staff and to alert the council that here were some concerns that the board had so that in subsequent conversations, there would be the understanding of, okay, you know, here's kind of what the board thought uh, would be important for it to uh, incorporate in its uh, deliberations. Um, so I never saw it as having legal uh, authority, but um, more providing guidance for what the board at that time thought would be appropriate information for it to make an informed decision. Yeah. And Michelle, you can. And it, it was well thought out and reading through it actually was really great because like these were questions I had, you know, reading through the packet and having them kind of consolidated here, you know, was really good. I mean, presumably you could ignore the resolution, and, but that, you know, the board might take umbrage at that ignorance and, uh, you know, do something different. But I think that was the, the intent was to provide some context and foundation for the board's further uh, you know, information. Yeah, so I was here during that time and I was the lone person to vote against that resolution for the record, but but not because I disagreed with the content in there, but more about the process in which the board was approaching it. Um, and what felt like um, at that time, a belief that it was a legally binding document, which it is not. Um, so, um, that that's primarily why I had voted against that, but um, just want to comment on that resolution. I I think that um, both departments have done a really good job in meeting those aspirational goals. Um, I, you know, there are some um, which we'll talk about um, some of the items that just are not reasonable to to reach, um, and so we'll talk about that next month, but. Um, I, I think that staff has done a, th a thorough job in going um, bullet point by bullet point and trying to meet those. Um, I saw that in the memo with the um, L&D document and with addressing the, the items on that resolution as well. Um, can I pivot to a different question? Shall can um, I just ask a quick question? Oh, sure, go ahead. If, if staff recommends uh, this disposal and we have an, um, a motion to 
approve it, couldn't that motion um, also address this resolution that it has either been, you know, uh, uh, all these issues have either been resolved to our satisfaction or we no longer see them as relevant? I mean, if we made the motion, we can undo the motion. So it seems to me it's a moot point if any future resolution is well drafted. So, okay. yeah, so yes, <laughs> we can we can do that. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think that the opening paragraph of the or one of the paragraphs of the actual resolution does say to the satisfaction or it does say they will meet these or shall complete to the satisfaction. So if you if you were to say we're satisfied with what has been met, I, I would say that yes you will you will be able to say that the the items in the resolution have been achieved or i would also venture to say you could create a motion that doesn't even reference the resolution right. too yeah. yeah right so i, yeah, I, I go ahead just you know the language i think the operative language is osb osbt will not officially consider unless these uh, uh conditions have first been fulfilled so it's like a you know well, if we've considered it, whether the conditions have been fulfilled or met to the satisfaction of the OSBT, you know, we've already kind of overridden the resolution. So I think just just by choosing to consider it um, and not mentioning the resolution um, would satisfy me from a legal perspective. And, and I also would just uh, go back to what Michelle said about how uh, I think staff's done a great job of addressing all of the, the issues that came up. So, for example, there's a really prescriptive condition that all the money has to be escrowed for all the improvement projects. And staff came back and said, well, it's in the budget. So, you know, we're not going to stick it in an escrow account. Um, so uh, that condition hasn't been met uh, or it's not going to be met according to the, the proposal. But I'm fine with it being budgeted. So I, I would entertain um, you know, hearing this matter. So that's how I look at it. Yeah. I, I wonder if we can get just some clear guidance so that we are are just like walking very cleanly through this process in March. Yep, we'll work on that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. And so I would echo both uh, Michelle and, and Harmon um, your sense of uh, you know the the status of the resolution. Um, and so I would also add my um, appreciation for the extent that both the utilities department and the open space staff went to the to uh, prepare the memo and the application. I thought that um, certainly um, you know those concerns or questions that were raised uh, were addressed, and uh, you know we can move ahead on. Uh, the consideration and decision at the appropriate time. Having said that, I, I do think there are some things that are worth clarifying or, or still remain kind of loose ends that we should probably talk about in, the, in preparation for the February 22nd um, you know, public hearing. Um, so uh, I guess that would be one way of addressing question one. Are, are there some clarifying questions or concerns about the information in the memo as it relates to you know our individual or collective understanding of our role i have what i think is a stupid question and hopefully is a quick answer but um when we were doing the site visit yesterday and uh, brandon was talking about the mitigation project in which utilities is managing, but OSMP is overseeing. And then Bethany, you brought up the three ID MOUs, um, which I, I, I think is to manage that relationship that OSMP between OSMP and, and utilities with regard to mitigation and monitoring. So my, my, my stupid question is why is OSMP not doing the mitigation work and monitoring? I know that we didn't want the the funding to come from OSMP, is it normal for utilities to do the mitigation work um, and monitoring, or is it more normal for OSMP to do that? I think maybe we can get two perspectives on that. Uh, 
Don and our involvement in that process, but maybe Joe from that question about does utilities actually do this thing with, on their projects? So maybe Joe, if you wouldn't mind addressing it from your perspective and then maybe Don could chime in too. Yes, and I see the green light is on. Is the mic on? No. Yep, I can hear you. Oh, I know. Just got shocked. <laughs> <laughs> Testing. It seems feels like it's on. Here. And good evening, trustees. I'm Joe Tadiucci. I'm the um, director of the utilities department for big capital projects that utilities does. Uh, we had another one several years ago in partnership with Northern Water that involved an open space disposal, the Carter Lake pipeline. And um, all of these projects have environmental mitigation. Northern Water oversaw that one, but uh, we've done the Lakewood pipeline and, and other big projects. And that is usually in the scope of our work, the environmental mitigation. And it's required to get the permits. This particular project, um, is, is a little more complex because of CU's ownership and the annexation agreement. And we wouldn't normally be acquiring 119 acres as we are um, in this situation. But I think we have some elements of the expertise in terms of monitoring wells and geotechnical investigations. But throughout this process, we've been working in partnership with Dan and his team. And I think we would continue to do that afterwards as well for the monitoring. Joe, you're considering a third party contractor to do the mo actual monitoring. Are you not? I don't know off the, off the top of my head. I'm not as involved in the details, but um, Don May from, or Bethany from working with Brandon. Uh, yeah, and to answer your question, Michelle, um, Open space contracts out a lot of our monitoring. Um, we work closely with consultants and um, folks from the university, other researchers to um, make sure that the monitoring is done um, according to our standards. And we work closely with those contractors and consultants on that type of work. This is a good example of that. Um, the, one of the reasons we do that is staff time. Um, the, the lift for staff to do a, a mitigation project of this size and also all of the monitoring that's associated with it, not only the mitigation monitoring for um, the uh, regulatory permits, but the non-regulatory monitoring of the groundwater conveyance system um, is just, it's just really a lot of work. So we are working clo really closely with utility staff and the consultants, um, uh, gosh, weekly, sometimes daily, um, just on the uh, reviewing 30% design, 60% design, having conversations about what's appropriate for monitoring, looking at the design reports and providing comments um, and things like that. So, so the, what you're saying is that the open space staff will not perform the actual monitoring. There will be more of an oversight uh, uh, element of the open space staff's work program. Correct. So a good example, I did talk in detail, a little bit of detail about the, um, the groundwater conveyance system monitoring. So open space staff is actually developing the study design and then we'll work with utilities to hire a, uh, an appropriate consultant to actually carry out the monitoring. We will, again, work with, with utilities to oversee the contractor. We won't hold the contract necessarily, right. but we'll be kind of the de facto um, department that, that uh, oversees that work. Yeah, I see it, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's kind of a co-project manager for the monitoring. Um, so with utilities, um, both departments are overseeing uh, that particular element of the project. I think why I got hung up on the, like uh, the, the, the mitigation management um, is because the, the 119 acres is becoming is, is turning from OSO to OSA mm -hmm. and it will now be um, open space land. So I thought, well, 
open space should be managing it. But I guess, um, you know, that 119, all of the mitigation work is probably not all on the 119, right? It's probably more than the 119, 119 acres. Um, it's all on the it's all on the 119. On the OSO, okay. yes. So that that all the all of the environmental mit mitigation work is being done on the 119 acres. Um, utilities is paying for it for the entire. Well, it's all happening under the 155 acres, and then the 119 will become open open space acquired lands eventually. That mitigation work is going to be done um, in, as part of all of this project. Um, and it will eventually be managed by OSMP. But the IDM MOU, the ID MOU is between OSMP and utilities to manage a contractor to do the mitigation work and for the monitoring going forward. But it's going to be a co-management system or a situation, but the lands will be managed by OSMP. Did I get that right? Okay. You got that right. Okay. Um, and uh, we actually, we did some of the same circles of when does it become open space? When do you turn it green on our maps, right? I mean, in terms of that management by OSMP. And we, we talked about all the management would be by OSMP, except what's being done, except the, the construction project, basically the mitigation project, which is a, you know, a, a construction project in, in, uh, in terms of constructing the wetland, you know, the, the wetland and habitat work. Um, and the reason we did that is that way we can apply OSMP rules and regs immediately. We can have rangers in force on that property immediately rather than this, is it utilities land, it's city owned, who, you know, who can do what on the property? And so calling it open space manage allows for some of that clarity, um, but they will, it, it is subject and it's very similar. We, you know, there was the, the CDOT mitigation project for the US 36 project that actually wrapped up just a couple of years ago over at basically 50 kids in Belmont right near our offices. Um, and that was, it was open space, but for years, it was a, a, a site that was mostly managed and, and operated by CDOT for a mitigation site. So Beth, Bethany, I'm going to piggyback on what Michelle said and what you yeah. just said, because one of my concerns in reading the memo is that that's not clear. Okay. And the fact of the matter is, is that there's often references to management by open space but there's never really, except actually in the application, the utilities application and, and some one place in the memo, which says that it actually will be open space. And so from my perspective, if we can clarify that um, and go through that process and it, with ultimately it is open, open official open space, OSA, you know, part of the system under the purview, the management of the open space and mountain parks department, because it looks like in some of the language that utilities continues to uh, own the property as the department in the city while open space manages it. And that's not what ultimately is yeah. going to happen. Yeah, we can be more clear on that. I think we were trying to distinguish the ongoing responsibility that the utility has to meet the regulatory requirements for success of the mitigation plan. Like it's, it's gonna be op open space land, but then there's responsibilities that the other department has in order to uh, implement and ensure the success of the mitigation project. So we were trying to do that balance and we can be stronger in, in, in the upfront of this is open space. Right, because the core actually is going to make the determination on the success of the mit mitigation plan. And when that determination is made, then it is officially open space. Is when that... both the city wetland permit closes out as well as right, the okay. or, and the, the, the any additional terms in the IDMOU. So it's kind of a three prong approach. Um, when, when those are satisfied, then yes, utilities gets kicked out and it's all open right. space. <laughs> So I think whatever my suggestion is, whatever you well, can do to clarify, clear, definitely, yeah. uh, we can work on that. That would really be great. And following up on one of the public comments and what some of us have already said on the use of the word permanent, we I think we need we we as 
Well, actually, I'm going to ask the board if, if they are um, uh, in, in uh, approval of removing the word permanent and putting in language that says uh, until the dam is decommissioned or until the dam no longer functions or something like that so that the there is some description of the reversion, you know, situation that once the dam is no longer functional, it is removed and the land reverts back to the open space system. And, and yes, we can be more clear. And I think we are just differentiating between the, the permanent, permanent use area and temporary use area. Right. And so we can, we can be more clear on the permanent use. I would say I don't, I don't think we want to be specific on if it's no longer, it will be removed because we may, you know, we have things abandoned in place, utilities and things on our property. If, if we determine it would be more impactful to remove things. So I think we would say at the time, if, and when that were to happen, decisions would be made, you know, that would be fine. Yeah. yeah. But, but I get your point. We'll be more, we'll, we'll be more specific on the kind of reversion or removal or cease to Great. be useful. Yeah. <laughs> cease to be used. uh, okay. Other questions for, included in, thanks Joe, in uh, question one. Uh, let me see. I mean, <laughs> uh, a couple. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so Don, I have a question for you uh, on the core's role. There, the tables show there are no jurisdictional wetlands um, that the core is responsible for. So why are why is the core the lead federal agency uh, on this project? Uh, that's a good question. Um, they, so the core, uh, ruled that there are no, uh, uh, wetlands under their jurisdiction under the 404 right. program under the Clean Water Act. They still have, um, uh, a, um, I'll call it a consulting responsibility where they, um, uh, work with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and sometimes the EPA to get comments back that pertain to the endangered spe or species that are uh, protected under the Endangered Species Act. So we still have to consult with the Fish and Wildlife Service because there is right. there is a nexus there, although it's not specific to a, a nationwide permit or an individual permit that the Corps usually um, issues for a project. They'll, they'll probably issue um, well, it's a pre-construction, a PCN, a pre-construction notification. And that is um, when a, a, a potential permittee goes to the core and says, hey, we have this project, um, here's our delineation, and we want you to rule on whether you have jurisdiction over those wetlands. And if they say no, then they issue a pre-construction notification to the permittee. Okay, but we're not anticipating that, right? We're not we're not anticipating that the core needs to issue either a nationwide permit or an individual permit. That's different than a pre-construction notification. Okay. The, okay. the PCN just says, yes, thanks for thanks for letting us know. We re reviewed your delineation in your report and we agree or disagree with your findings that there are or aren't jurisdictional wet or wetlands under our jurisdiction in the project area. So does the city's wetland permit uh, override the Corps' role? Um, in a sense, yes, because there are a lot of wetlands that um, the Corps does not take jurisdiction over, especially because of the recent ruling. Right. Um, but the city's ordinance uh, protects wetlands water and other water bodies much more stringently than the core does um they're regulated the the uh i think it's uh section 939 of the city code um regulates those resources and they're based on um uh mapping of wetlands within the city limits but it applies to all land that's owned outside the city limits or 
where a project that the city um, is doing is managing or paying for outside the city limits also. So those are also always are also subject to city code, the okay. wetland ordinance. So the city's permit actually will supersede yes. um, the core. Yes. Okay. Uh, other questions or comments on, on one? Um, I have one more and Joe, this is probably for you. Um, I'm concerned that as we as a board consider the uh, request for disposal slash transfer, <laughs> um, that the permitting situation, and I've said this in previous meetings, but it just strikes me that there's there are loose ends flopping around out there as far as the permitting situation is concerned. It, and let me give you an example. Um, you know, the state engineer is responsible for approving, you know, the, the dam's construction. Mm -hmm. And, but uh, we don't have any indication of its approval or its consideration or anything. And so why would we as a board vote for disposal for a project that we're not even sure the state engineer is going to approve, or if in the approval, um, their approval uh, includes um, things that will expand the project footprint that we have just disposed of. So aren't we concerned that we may have to come back to the board uh, you know, given the fact that we really don't have any definitive permit information on this project? Yeah, it's a, it's a fair question. And I, I mentioned the prior project that we did a few years ago that involved an open space disposal. Right. And um, it, it was similar status when we came for the disposal discussion. And in that one, and I remember working with Bethany, it was a conditional experience. Uh, disposal. And so an important point in this one is that um, the team has had to work really hard to pin down the disturbance area. And um, uh, Dan and Don mentioned how it has reduced over time and we've been we've been working towards that goal. And so some of the project components and how they will sit on the ground and how they will be oriented. Um, if you think about the east end of the spillway wall, we've made some changes to that and it has evolved over time. And so we, we really needed this disposal process to be our North Star for establishing the details of the project and for getting it to a point where we're ready to bring it for permitting. And so there are a number of agencies who, who will be permitting it. And it is our practice as utilities to go and meet with those agencies in advance for a big project, tell them what's coming, make sure we understand what the approval situation is. And our team has done that. And, and we see a path to approval, don't see any red flags. If we did, we wouldn't be here tonight. Like if, if we thought there's a big problem with agency X, Y, or Z, um, we wouldn't be at a point where we would be asking you. So we, we see that we have established a path for approval with all of these agencies. You don't have that approval until you have it, but it's, it, we're just following that typical practice for a project. And in terms of the open space board to feel comfortable managing the risk, like are we voting on something that we're, we're giving something away that may not be approved and can we get it back? That's why it's conditional. So the project is, is kind of at a typical place in its development where we would start this permitting process and we have enough information that we feel comfortable asking the board and council to act on this and, and are not seeing big roadblocks to um, receiving permits and getting approvals. Uh, let me just ask you uh, one other example and CDOT mm -hmm. is, is the one in the, the flood wall tie-in. Mm -hmm. um, and you said that, you know, that's been moved around, uh, you know, some um, over time. So if CDOT doesn't agree on the location of the tie-in, 
what does that mean as far as our considering the disposal of, um, of land for the flood wall? I don't see a lot of potential that they would make a change like that. Um, they're a, a big part of setting ourselves up to be positioned for approval, the state engineer, um, FEMA, the Federal Highway Administration, and CDOT had to agree on, on the approach and who, who is the lead agency. And so I think there was more complexity in working through that process and, and getting that established, and we've done that. Um, and the, the um, Department of Transportation, they know what we're planning. Brandon and the team have been keeping them apprised of the details of where the tie-in is and, and what's intended. We have um, at least one agreement that I know of with CDOT to review our hydrology and make sure they're comfortable, that we're managing flows through their bridge. And I think I said this at the last meeting, if they had no intention of approving this project, they wouldn't bother with those kind of supporting agreements and, and, and they would just say this, this isn't, this isn't going to happen, but um, they're, they're working in partnership with us and just met with a, a representative with Brandon last week in, in this building and, and the words win-win were used. So I know there is um, some opposition to this project and there was a letter many years ago. We, we are, so far beyond that point and and so far down the road so um i don't know if that helps but that's some context for how we're working with cdot no thank thanks for that and um i was just going to ask bethany uh can you send the board a copy of the carter lake pipeline conditional disposal so that we would have would be able to see you know an example of what we might be doing um that's happened previously yeah i can send you i can send you a couple where there have and you've actually done one fairly recently where you conditioned the um the gebhardt sewer line disposal where you said they'll have these things you know they'll have an approved site plan before the the easement will be conveyed so in this situation it would be the project will be fully permitted before that conveyance idmou is executed totally makes sense. They don't need the land if they don't get it permitted. But in order to get some of this permitting, they have to show they could construct it. They do have control to construct it. So it's kind of that, that well, back I, and forth and why you would put conditions on, on, on certain things. So yeah, I just yep. think the magnitude of this project, if there are other similar projects and language that the yeah, we can, we can, future, or not future previous boards have used uh, or considered, I think um, that would be helpful. Sure. during our consideration yeah and just so you know we will have a a pretty robust uh we're anticipating having a pretty robust staff recommendation that will also lay out right what those Great. conditions would be okay are we good on one <laughs> all right uh two uh do, do we anticipate needing uh other information we may have talked a little about that already um did uh, did your review of the utility de utilities department's uh, application um, kind of raise any questions about additional information or anything? We are we good with that? Okay. Uh, and the process and timeline that uh, Dan just uh, reviewed. Um, uh, any concerns uh, about that, uh, John? Uh, do we know if February 22nd is going to be in person or virtual yet? Yeah, so here's the prevailing guidance. So um, we originally were uh, put in to CAC that we will we'll hold a special meeting on the 29th of February, which is the fifth Thursday, which is usually a night off for council. And they really were trying to uh, uphold that uh, not having a fifth Thursday. So they asked staff to go back and see if we could do some juggling to find another date. So what we are doing is we are borrowing, kicking out a study session on the 22nd of February. That was typically a study session date and making this a special meeting instead for this item. Special meetings and study sessions are 
virtual. And so that question came up uh, at CAC on Monday is, uh, uh, it, you know, what format is this meeting and explaining that, well, if we were to follow the guidance, virtual, I mean, uh, special meetings and study sessions are virtual. And that's the information we provided CAC. They have not made a change from that as of yet, so. Is it the desire of the board to propose uh, in person? Uh, I, I didn't have a strong feeling one way or the other. I was just more curious about the, the logistics. Um, would, uh, would a board uh, suggestion or recommendation be helpful in that uh, conversation, Dan? Um, I think CAC would be the ultimate, you know, body that if, if, if the board did bring forward a, a suggestion to council, I, I would forward that to the city manager to bring that forth at a CAC meeting is probably the sequence of how that would work. Uh, is there a sentiment to do that? Although I think it would be cool to do a joint meeting with them in person, I also don't really have a strong feeling um, to do it in person. It's almost yeah. easier to do it all remote with that, man that many people. Okay. Th that's yeah. my take. The, the logistics, I imagine, would be tough uh, trying to get us all into one room. Uh, this would probably be the room. <laughs> <laughs> and all the microphones and, and all of that. Um, I have a question about the the, the process itself. So then, and you laid it out earlier, Dan, is we're going to have a staff presentation. We're going to have a lot of community input, I'm sure. And then or there's going to be an allowance for clarifying questions, but there's not going to be any deliberation that night. That's right. Each board, typically, if, if you didn't do that, the board would first deliberate on its own then council and this with this combined you still need to go and deliberate as separate bodies uh, because you would be providing you would need to provide uh council with an osbt recommendation so at that public hearing it would just be a staff recommendation at that point you would then deliberate and if you approve you would form a recommendation it could 100 percent mimic staff recommendation but if you had a, a different recommendation that recommendation would also go to city council and then they would consider that but our role in that process on that night would be to ask clarifying questions after the staff presentation and presumably after the public comment mm, i think no i think that the public comment would be over and then the mayor probably would wrap it up and then you would go back, you heard the public comment, you asked the clarifying questions, you heard the st uh, staff recommendation and the staff presentation. And then you would, at that point, typically, if it was all one meeting, you would go into your deliberations after public hearing. But instead of going into deliberations, you would stop and then you all would go into your own deliberations after that, um, separately from council on, on the March 13th. You're, you're still confusing me because you said after public comment, there would be clarifying questions. So, so no, no, clarifying questions would go before public hearing. So it would be a staff presentation, clarifying questions, and then the mayor would open it up for public hearing. Because the council, in my experience, has certainly responded to public comment or asked further questions. So there... It, and I don't know, this may we be can get We can get some, we haven't uh, talked about that micro specific, so we, we can continue. Yeah, it would to just strike me that that would be helpful if there, something comes up in public comment that we want both bodies to, you know, can, you know, be part of the consideration that that would be an opportunity to do that. Okay, I will, I'll, I'll seek more information on Great. how that will work. Uh, any other process? Questions? Just for the record, I, I'm a definitely an in-person meeting guy, and I'm very disappointed that we're not going to have an in-person opportunity. I think it's far more effective to do that uh, rather than on Zoom. But I think that uh, that's not shared by the board and probably not by the council either. So. Dave, I would just ask, what is your definition in this case of effective? 
same way. By effective, what do you what do you mean? Like how in your experience, how is a in person hearing more effective well, than a virtual? Uh, for me, it just provides an opportunity for you know a little more informal conversation and and you know discussion that you know I can reach out and you know, touch Harmon or Michelle and, you know, and whisper. And all no, no touching during hearings. <laughs> I know. Yeah. 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 It's a virtual, it's a virtual thing. Yeah. Yeah. She, she would pass it on to her. Uh, it's just, a, yeah, just a little more, if I can use the word intimate. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, I just think it's hard to kind of have a really focused conversation on a screen. But, uh, that's okay. If that's the decision, that's the way it is. Okay. Uh, anything else for the good of the order on this particular topic? See none. Thank you very much. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. And we will look forward to February 22nd. Great. A reminder to the board, though, we do have a meeting on February 14th, which happens to be Valentine's Day. So in the interest of uh, uh, succumbing to the council's preference not to meet on a fifth Thursday, maybe we should consider not meeting on Valentine's Day. What do you think? <laughs> Let, let's switch up another meeting day. <laughs> it's my birthday. Then, oh, there oh, we, well, we have to meet then, because this is where you want to be. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <Are you> nuts? <laughs> uh, if I could just take a moment that you can imagine between December 15th when we got the quest and today there was a lot of work that needed to be done over the holiday season. And so just want to uh you know, Bethany was the main spearhead, but then Don came in in earnest. So just thanks to Don and Bethany and and the utility staff for uh working over the next four weeks of putting all this together. So kudos to you. Guys. Yes. Thank you very much to, to all and you, you guys, especially, and also uh, for the field trips for board and council. I, I know we have one remaining, but uh, all of that, I think has been helpful in the course of the conversation. Right. Um, and Dave, absolutely. I actually do not have any director verbal updates tonight. So with that, I'll turn it back to you. Whoa, what time is it? We, we still have an hour. What can we do for the next hour? <laughs> no. Uh, are there any other comments or concerns that the board would like to address? Seeing none, I declare the meeting adjourned. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh,